Everybody, please be seated. Welcome. Today is November 30th, and it is, from what I understand, a day of gratitude, which I find interesting. Uh, I believe that's correct. Uh, anyway, if it if it isn't a day of gratitude, it's a good way for us to begin uh, uh, the class today uh, because we are, I am, and I hope all of you are grateful for being able to be here. Um, today uh, is uh, a day where Aaron's going to do some double duty. I'm going to ask her to uh, give a short overview for the any any new people that may be joining us today Carol? sure um, everyone please keep your devices muted and cameras turned off um, uh, if you wanted to make any comment um, during the class please turn on your camera uh, or try to make noise so a speaker knows that you're trying to make a comment sometimes when um, i don't see someone on the camera uh, if i don't hear it i don't see it um, so please uh, make noise to make uh, the comment. And once you're done, please turn off your cameras and go back to mute mode. Try not to chat or um, uh, add reactions to uh, during the class. That's uh, kind of disturbed the uh, speaker. Um, and we are recording this uh, class for today for our uh the platform sutras uh library so just wanted to make sure everybody's aware of that as well thank you roger thank you thank you um as we before we begin i'd like to uh introduce aram of course uh she it was it was kind of uh interesting this uh last two weeks uh, Brother Michael uh, did uh, had three responsibilities uh, in, uh, as a speaker with us and at the temple. Uh, Aram had some multiple duties uh, in the last couple of weeks, and so did I. And it seemed like uh, we we haven't seen each other in a while, as but uh, in the last couple of weeks we've seen each other uh, and interacted with each other in a very positive way. And I just Thought that was interesting. A uh, little comment. Uh, the speaker for tonight is Aram, as I said, and she will be covering the Platform Sutra, page 209 to 215. And it's a, I think it's kind of an interesting uh, section. I won't, I won't take away from what she may, may be saying. Uh, and it's, I'll just say it's of particular interest, uh, but I do find it interesting the the word choices that are used to to, to describe things. And uh, I, I don't know if everybody else felt the same way. I'm interested in hearing uh, our speakers' comments uh, tonight and and your comments too. So uh, I'd like to say that uh, you know not only does Aram. Uh, has she been participating pretty uh, pretty much in the last couple of weeks, at least three times, including tonight. And uh, she's been very active uh, with the, uh, the online Skype platform uh, Sutra, as well as the other uh, topics that we've been covering while on, uh, on Skype. Uh, she uh, is good. <laughs> she's 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 been active in that way. She's also been active, uh, very active in her community, I might say. And uh, of course, she's working full time out of the house as well. And she's doing uh, construction. She's uh, actually, uh, in my opinion, the contractor uh, for all the different uh, subcontractors there at the house. So she's uh, quite busy and uh, and committed and uh, wants to get as much help as she can in, in her community, as well as preparing her home uh, for uh, the uh, introduction, introduction of a family temple there. 
so she's quite uh, she's she she's very she's very active right now, let us say. And uh, I might say she needs to uh, be a little careful with her uh, with her energy uh, right now. Uh, I mentioned something about uh, in my talk Sunday about we need to focus on the things that are really critical and really important and then let the other things that that really aren't important to us or I should say not important to us, but not certainly a priority. And, uh, we all need to, to, to do that uh, because if we don't, we will be unable to do what we really need to do. And uh, I believe that is is the cultivation of being able to help other people. And uh, uh, I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, I was warned many, many years ago uh, by a senior executive that uh, uh, was watching out for me, and he said that I was doing too many things. And within two weeks uh, after that, I came down and got very, very sick. And uh, if it wasn't for my wife, I probably wouldn't uh, be sitting here today talking to you guys because she intervened with the doctors and they saved saved my life basically so i i speak from experience when i say we need to uh yes we need to be committed we need to be responsible but we also have to remember that if we're not taking care of ourselves first we're really not able to do the things that are essential for us to do and i say that with a great love and and uh, and uh, gratitude for the opportunity to say that not only to every one of you, uh, to every one of you. Uh, so I'm very grateful. Today is a day of gratitude. Uh, Aaron, I don't know if that's as, as the introduction that I was planning on giving, but uh, I'm very grateful for you to be here tonight and to give us this lesson. Thank, Thank you. you. <clears throat> Thank you, Roger. It's um, when selflessness is embedded in your blood, um, nothing can stop you from helping when the duty calls. So that's exactly what's going on in my world right now. Um, I've been told to take care of uh, my personal items, uh, but when there is war going on, the warrior doesn't back off. So <laughs> that's exactly what was going on in the community, and I think we are winning. Uh, thanks, Roger, for bringing that up. <clears throat> so uh, before I begin, everyone, uh, uh, good evening. I wanted to give thanks to the grace of God um, and thanks for the great mercy of the Grand Master Miller Buddha. Thanks for the great virtue of Shizu and Shimu. Thanks for the protection of Baiswe uh, Santi Vunsi Bodhisattva. Thanks for our Point Master Wong, Point Master C, Elder Mama C. Uh, and uh, Master Tong, who are watching over us from heaven now. Thanks for our Pine Master Jane and her team from Taiwan and uh, uh, their dedication and support uh, for us, for our temple. And thanks for our Pine Master Chang, Pine Master Kuang, Pine Master Gao, Pine Master Wu for their encouragement and support. Thanks for my introducer and guarantor, and thanks for all of you being here, um, joining us uh, via Skype. <clears throat> Today, uh, as Roger mentioned, um, I've been giving the opportunity, this is my actually first class uh, on this book, uh, the Platform Sutra by Hoinan, the Sixth Patriarch. Um, as I was studying, I was remembering the the few years back we studied Diamond Sutra, and actually for the uh, for the Tuesday class, and we studied it twice uh, because it was uh, demanded by or the requested by the students that they join in the middle of the uh, the curriculum, and then we had to start all over again. And I was absolutely thrilled and very happy as we were studying Diamond Sutra. And that particular book um, brought me to a, a new light, um, and I felt this deep affinity with the Shakyamuni Buddha. And his words were like some, someone was taking words out of my mouth. It's, it, it was a feeling when you, you think you know the concepts, you're living that life, 
but you have never put those those concepts into words. So it, it was really eye opening at that point. The synergy was um, very real um, and I have never encountered anything like that before. And now, as I am reading the uh, the platform sutra, the more I read, the more I understand uh, the Wu Wei, the art of no rejection, no grasping, and simply accepting um, to uh, who I am and what it is. And not um, and that's not to say that I am giving up. It is to say uh, that I am giving in and surrendering to the reality. And in other words, I am satisfied, I am content, and um, which is the opposite of duk, uh, uh, suffering or dissatisfaction, one of the three uh, marks of existence taught by Shakyamuni Buddha. And those of you who don't know the three marks of existence, um, it is impermanence, suffering, of course, and the non-self. So the more I read the sutra, the more I understand uh, that there is absolutely nothing to achieve, pursue, or seek. Rather, develop an understanding through our everyday life experiences and then practice uh, those understanding. If we understand that, then we are completely free. We are truly liberated. And this understanding, this insight is called parajnya, or um, we've been um, saying uh, parajna. So parajnya is a, um, it is a knowingness rather than the knowledge. That's the difference between the wisdom and the knowledge. There is one knowingness and the other one is knowledge. And parajnya is so broad and so far seeing but at the same time, it is tremendously penetrating and exact. Um, and it comes into our everyday aspect of life. For example, um, to, um, to know that things are impermanent, to truly realize this, to truly knowing that everything is, uh, is impermanent and happily living with that, happily uh, accepting the reality, that is a form of wisdom, prajnya. Um, it is not just experiencing the world and our life, uh, but also being uh, not distracted by something else. So truly knowing that everything in this samsara is dissatisfactory or dukkh, um, and dukkh doesn't mean here pain, it means dissatisfaction. Understanding that fully and accepting that, that is also a form of parajnya. And also knowing that nothing in this world really belongs to anybody. It is just a uh, temporary ownership that we have. Accepting that is also a form of parajnya or wisdom. Though there are many, many ways we can uh, look at this beautiful word parajnya. Uh, but the most important thing uh, about this insight is that we need to get the understanding of it, of ourselves, to become wise, to find a mature way of experiencing our reality. Because reality is here all the time. Reality is not a separate entity. So it is a question of becoming one with reality not achieving oneness, but becoming identified with it. And so um, if you think about it, um, we are already part of the reality. So all remain is that we need, the all remain is that our doubt. And then we, you know, once we discovered that, we discovered that we always been here all along. And so, uh, when I said, uh, as I said earlier, that we don't need to understand, um, we need to un develop this understanding of pra uh, prajna through our personal experiences. And that is where this concentration is needed. So I will cover today page number 209 to 215, which is chapter four, concentration and wisdom. 
Um, we are using this uh, <clears throat> particular book here, the translation from this book. So the pages that I mentioned, 209 to 15, are coming from this particular book. I am going to start where Brother Michael left last week, uh, last week but I have decided um, not to go by line by line of the text and uh, explanation of the text. Um, there are a lot of Buddhist terms and Sanskrit words they are used in the sutra. So today I will focus on the basic understanding of the terms and the main idea of this chapter, essentially um, whatever is covered on those particular pages that I am covering. So once you understand the terms and then the core message uh, of this chapter, you will be able to understand the sutra just by reading it on your own. Um, so please do keep the book um, in front of you because I will reference to the page numbers as I uh, will deliver my message. So first, let me um, give you an overview uh, for uh, or the main idea, the portion um, that I will cover today. Let me share my screen real quick first. And let me know if you can see my screen. This will show you what. Um, yes, yes. OK, perfect. So this is the structure, uh, the way I am going to cover this class today. Um, though the entire chapter, it focuses on the concentration and wisdom. Um, but page number 209 to 215, it focuses on the sudden and gradual uh, teachings or cultivation. No thoughts, no dwelling. Uh, no mark, no dharma, and suchness. Uh, so these are the terms that they are used in this chapter, and I'm going to explain them um, because they these segments, they are mentioned here, they are all segments of mindfulness, a.k.a. meditation. So I'll be using these two terms, meditation and mindfulness, interchangeably. They are the same thing. Uh, but I wanted to start with the uh, saying the motto of uh, Huenen, where he says that know your mind to know your nature. And that is the motto is uh, revolving around this chapter. Uh, so if we understand the true meaning of meditation and mindfulness, you will understand that all these bits and pieces of no dwelling, no thought, no marks, and no dharma. So keeping this meditation and mindfulness in mind, let me start by saying that we um, got so used to seeing ourselves, as Brother Roger was saying earlier, living in such a busy world. The problem is not the world. Being busy, the problem is not the people, but with ourselves. Wisdom is innate in us, and it is not something that can be bought, heard, or received from outside. But our involvement with the external environment and the distractions uh, uh, of our own emotions, uh, they cause this layering that prevent us from observing um, ourselves carefully. And we don't give ourselves enough time, as he was saying earlier, and space to use our innate wisdom to observe ourselves before we act. And so this mindfulness and this meditation, it helps us to look inward. It helps us refraining from our dualistic tendency to pay more attention to external issues than the internal issues. And I'm talking about the issues, uh, the one that we usually don't want to work on. And with mindfulness, there exists the possibility for wisdom to arise with every human being. So the practice of mindfulness is not a method uh, for, to, uh, for us to attain realization, but it is enlightenment itself. Basically saying, you don't meditate to uh, be enlightened, your mindfulness shows that how enlightened you are or not. And there are three uh, integral uh, factors of Buddhist meditation. Brother Michael actually mentioned them last time in his class. It is morality, concentration, and wisdom. 
the morality is, is spoken of first because it is the foundation for the other two. The importance of morality cannot be overstressed. Without morality, uh, no other practice can be undertaken. Uh, morality is the basic precepts. And this triangle right here is also known as the threefold training or the eightfold path. Uh, it is consist of, of course, the higher value, morality. In Sanskrit, it is called adhisila or just sila. Um, higher mind, which is the concentration, samadhi. And uh, higher wisdom, which is the parajnya. And these are the fundamental, um, these three are fundamental to successful meditation or mindfulness practice. But we must have good sila morality as the first step because um, without that, if you don't have the precept, your meditation is absolutely useless because you don't have any foundation. So these factors, um, they grow together as your practice and each one of them, they influence each other. So you cultivate all three of them uh, at the same time, not separately, not one by one. Um, basically saying that true concentration, it comes from morality or the precepts. And precepts produce concentration. Concentration without wisdom is useless. And you need concentration for your wisdom to unfold. And in result, wisdom will make your morality stronger naturally. And precept will help you increase your concentration. So they go in like circle, in circle like the three wheels of a tricycle. So if you naturally have this triangle as a part of your daily practice, it doesn't take you long to understand the truth. And you fall under the sudden group that was mentioned on page number 209. But if you don't fall under the sudden group, then obviously you fall under the gradual group, meaning you learn slowly and you need to train your mind. And um, as I was reading the sudden and gradual, um, I remember the uh, what Lao Tzu says in uh, on chapter 41 in uh, Tao Te Ching. He said the superior man, as soon as he hears the path, earnestly practices the teaching. The average man hearing of the path, sometimes he remembers it and sometimes he forgets it. The inferior man here of here, when he hears about the path, he ridicules it. So the truth is, again, there is absolutely nothing to achieve or attain. It is just a sudden understanding or gradual understanding of the truth. And if one sees that, and don't try to look for reasons. He will understand it quickly. Uh, but if he makes the point uh, in, in his mind and aim for the destination, um, he will understand very slowly. And so to demonstrate that, I have a story to share with you guys. You probably heard this story before. Um, there was a, a martial arts student uh, he went to see a uh, sensei and he asked him, he told him that I am devoted to your study of a martial art. Um, tell me how long it will take me to be master of it. Uh, the sensei said 10 years at least. And so the, the students say, my God, 10 years, that is a very long time. What if I uh, work twice as much, study twice as much um, and harder than your other students. The master said, then it will take you 20 years. Uh, he said, 20 years? What if I practice it day and night and put all my effort into it? Since they said, then it will take you 30 years. He said, what? How is it that each time I say I will work harder, you tell me that it will take longer? So the answer is clear. When you fixed upon your destination, you are too busy getting somewhere 
or becoming somebody that you forget where you are or what you are. So the stance that one takes to become enlightened, it is a trap. The, it's, it is a place where you are not enlightened. And it is funny that the mind that tries to understand is the mind that is stops us from understanding it. How awesome is that? So the wise one knows that his mind is the path. The other makes the path beyond his mind. And he doesn't even know that where the path is, nor does he know that mind itself is the path. And that's why in Buddhism, the training of mindfulness is based on person's morality, concentration, and wisdom. Uh, next, I will talk about the mindfulness and meditation. But before I move on, uh, floor is open if you wanted to make any comment or have any questions. Go ahead, Roger. So I think what I'm hearing is when he asks us to say, I don't know why. Um, I don't know either. I'm only on one channel. <clears throat> okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, what, what I believe to me was the message I heard about the 10 years, 20 years, and 30 years based on the perseverance was that the complexity was being laid out perhaps by the ego so that the person had so many, uh, let us say, uh, efforts to the goal that it blinded the person that it, it on, on that path and caused more barriers or more waves as uh, as uh, we've been told the triptych master described uh, those complexities as waves in the ocean preventing you from the getting to the destination is that what i heard yes and also the fixation so you are so focused on that's why this meditation i was i'm about to uh, say that next that there are many misconceptions about this meditation um, and it's the same way. Meditation uh, is such a cliche here, and especially in Western countries, it, because it tells you to focus on one thing. And that's not true. And that's just like this young man. He would have been so focused on achieving the mastery of it that he would have forgotten everything else that why he even doing it. And it happens all the time. Um, the practice of mindfulness, you know, it does not involve uh, the, um, um, it doesn't say that discontinue one's relationship with yourself and looking for a better person or searching for the possibility outperform uh, oneself and becoming a better person. The practice of mindfulness is a way of uh, continuing one's um, confusions chaos, um, uh, aggression, and passion, and work with that, seeing it from the enlightened point of view. Uh, and there is a word in Sanskrit for basic meditation. It's called samatha, which means developing of peace. And in this case, peace refers to the harmony uh, connected with the accuracy rather than the peace from the point of view of the pleasure and pain. Um, we experience this pain and discomfort in life because we fail to relate with the harmony of things as they are. And meditation is a lot like cultivating a new land um, to make a field out of forest. Um, first, we need to clear out the trees and pull out all the stumps, and then you till the soil and fertilize it so your seeds uh, and and harvest your crop with faith morality mindfulness and wisdom the the faith on morality by the way have a very special meaning in this context 
in Buddhism, uh, Buddhism doesn't advocate faith in the sense of believing something because it is written in a book or attributed to a prophet or uh, talked to you by some uh, authority figure. The meaning of faith here is uh, closer to confidence. Um, it is it is knowing that something is true because you have seen it work, because you have uh, observed that very thing within yourself. Um, and in the same way, morality is not a ritualistic obedience to a uh, code of behavior imposed by an external authority either. Uh, it is rather a healthy habit patterns uh, that you have consciously and voluntarily choose, uh, chosen to impose upon yourself because you recognize its superiority uh, to your present behavior. You have seen it, the results. So meditation is not trying to escape from the life or running from the reality, uh, but see what it is facing the reality, being 100% honest with yourself, and which requires tremendous amount of wisdom. Um, think of this way, uh, with this uh, story that I say, let's refer to that one. Whenever we have this dualistic notion, uh, such as I am doing this because I wanted to achieve a particular state of consciousness, uh, a particular state of being, then automatically we are separating ourselves from the reality of what we already are and what it is. Because now you want it to be over there rather than dealing with the issues that they are here. And why do we do that? Because when we watch our own um, mind and body, we notice certain things, they are unpleasant. Uh, to uh, realize since, you know, we don't like them, we try to reject them. So the goal here with the mindfulness and meditation is the awareness. And but awareness often implies to self-consciousness or just being aware of the things going on around you. But in this case, the awareness is simply seeing the situation accurately. It does not particularly mean that you're watching yourself speak or um, acting, but rather seeing the situation as a whole. So when a person is able to see what is now without being influenced by the past or the expe expectations of the future, but just seeing that the very moment of now, then at that moment, there are no barriers. And that kind of mindness, uh, mindfulness we need all the time, not just when we are sitting alone, uh, alone in a meditation. And for that, we need this threefold training of morality, consciousness, and wisdom. And if you don't have any question, I will move on to morality. Anybody wanted to make any more comments here? Okay, so go you're, ahead. I'm sorry. Not, go ahead. You're, you're talking about first versus third. Say that um, again, Roger. You're really, to me, you're really talking about individual first versus third. You know, to 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 cause or to change requires, uh, and you know, as as I remember from. Uh, years ago, struggle is required to, to bring about change. And not only did uh, Martin Luther say that, but it's been said for centuries. Uh, and that struggle, a lot of people don't like that struggle. They, they, they prefer to, to just leave things the way they are because they don't, they don't have the, the courage or the or the understanding, to use your words, to uh, to look about themselves and, and make changes. Because they already have that inside themselves. So 
so they're struggling with it so they they cover it up i've always talked about uh till you uh, are awakened you're pretty much as an individual covered up by a sleeping bag and you know it's like the only thing showing are your eyes but as you start to peel back that sleeping bag those things that uh, are are necessary to remove to bring about the revealing as i said this weekend of that candle that is in us that spirit that light that's in us it's basically covered up by that sleeping bag and so we have to peel that away and that's what i think you're talking about but having the courage to do that Mm -hmm. is it's that inside work boxers talk about the physical stuff on the outside the easy stuff it's the inner work that is the hard stuff and to be successful as a boxer you've got to do that in, inside work and as we as cultivators have to do that inside work too mm -hmm. yes that's true <clears throat> that's more than i wanted to say I'm sorry. no no you're you're right and uh what you just said, I'm actually going to talk about it in different places. Um, so let me start with the morality. And I was, uh, when I was studying that, what I've I found about morality, I was, um, I'm so excited to share what I'm about to share now. So the, you know, we know that morality is self-evident, you know, principle. Uh, it is discipline, it's the precepts. Precepts, you know, are the law of um, nature and so are the consequences um, because they are self-evident. They are not commandments. These are principles um, and law of nature. And in Buddhism, you know, there are, we already know there are five precepts, uh, which is no killing, no stealing, no sexual misconduct, uh, no, uh, no lying, no intoxication. Uh, and we've been repeating that, but what I noticed here, uh, there are a couple of things. One, I noticed that they have uh, the three main consideration uh, in these five uh, precepts, and it start with the compassion. Uh, and then the other one I noticed here is the karma, the law of cause and effect. And also getting rid of the defilements, uh, things that spoil our mind and body. But not just knowing these precepts and even understanding them fully um, is just not enough. You know, we, we need to, of course, uh, act upon them and uh, actually act according to these precepts. But there is more. Um, there are actually three levels of morality. The lowest level is based on the set of rules and regulation, and most people fall under this level of morality, where uh, <clears throat> we have the regulations that they lay down uh, by somebody else. Uh, that could be your favorite prophet, um, a religion, it could, it could be the state, the head of the tribe, or a parent. Uh, so no matter who uh, Grant generated these rules. Um, all you have to do at this level is just know the rules and follow the rules. And a robot can do that. Even a trained chimpanzee uh, could do that if the rules are simple enough and he were smacked every time with the stick every time he breaks the rule. The next level of morality uh, is consists of obeying the, the same rules um, even when nobody is looking uh, and because you uh, uh, have internalized these rules, so you smack yourself uh, every time you break the rule. This level of uh, requires a little bit of mind control, but if your thoughts are chaotic, your behavior will be chaotic too. The third level of morality is a quantum leap up the scale from the first two levels, a complete shift in orientation. And at this level, a uh, person does not follow hard and fast rules uh, dictated by the authority. The person choose, chooses to follow the path um, dictated by mindfulness, wisdom, and compassion. And this level requires real intelligence and ability to juggle all the factors in every situation to arrive at the unique 
creative and appropriate response every time. And this person at this level sees the entire situation from an objective point of view, uh, give equal way to his or her um, own needs and those of others. So in other words, he or she is free from greed, uh, hatred, envy, and all the other selfish junk that normally keep us from seeing the other person's side of you or the side of the issues that they are having. So if you don't have this third level of morality, again, your meditation is absolutely useless because your foundation is not stable. It is almost like <clears throat> rowing the boat, but your boat is, uh, is still tied to the dock. So keep rowing your boat, but you're not going to go anywhere. So the, the question is that who has that level of morality? The people who follow their true self the, and, and they practice the concentration and wisdom. And in result, their, their foundation of morality um, gets even stronger and is stronger. Um, now I'm going to move on to concentration of a uh, higher mind and samadhi. But if anybody wants to make any comment, please, uh, uh, floor is open. Okay, so we're going to move on to <clears throat> concentration. Concentration literally means awareness, uh, being in a state of uh, awake, being mindful simply awake to the life situations as they are. Concentration is the um, stillness of the mind. Think of the uh, muddy water. That is how the restless mind is. But when we take a breather, uh, bring our attention to our inner self, we reflect, <clears throat> and that's the word we usually use for meditation. We reflect, we observe our thoughts, uh, let them come and go. Don't grasp them. You will feel the sense of calmness. You will find that calmness. And this calmness uh, can only be uh, genuine if the foundation of morality exists, especially the third level of morality, uh, where you are not uh, stuck with uh, some set of rules. So you, you feel free and you use your wisdom. And at that point, this muddy water is so clear that you can see through everything, including your real reflection. So concentration is not a uh, matter of dwelling or fixated upon one thing as usually people think meditation is about thinking or not thinking and focusing on um, one thing. But it means being awake to the whole situation as well as, as the experiencing the simplicity of the event. Um, and to achieve that kind of concentration, it requires wisdom. Um, Wisdom, is, it takes the practice of concentration to a completely different light. Um, with wisdom, concentration becomes uh, awareness of the whole environment um, of the particular situation that you're in. The more wisdom you have, the better you are solving problems in your daily life and you will make better moral choices. Uh, the simple example I can give you here would be, um, it is easier to make better living uh, with wisdom without greed, right? On page number 211 and 212, uh, the sutra mentioned <clears throat> how having wrong understanding of the teaching can cause confusion. Uh, especially if you are sharing your misunderstanding and misconceptions with others. Huynan said that that is unacceptable. 
but that is from Hernan's point of view. So let's forget about the misunderstanding of the Dharma or the teaching. Let me share with you um, something with a perspective of daily life situation. As uh, Roger was saying earlier, uh, people wanted to change the world and um, all of those things. So the human heart <clears throat> is basically good. It is it is generous and it is compassionate. But it may not always work together with the wisdom. The issue is that we have many people ready to go out there, change the world for the better, but they view philosophy, religion, politics, even matter of spirituality according to what they like according to what they want. So when you live your life by precepts, practicing concentration, you will be able to observe uh, your delusions. You, you will know that your views are baseless and not dependable. In this way, you can cut that confusion and doubt that Huynan talked about. That is what I call wisdom. And with this kind of wisdom, with this wisdom, you will have the true understanding of non-dwelling, uh, no thought, no marks, and no dharma. These four terms um, are mentioned throughout the chapter. So I'm going to jump into no dwelling. But before I go to no, no dwelling, anybody wanted to make any comment about wisdom or prajna? Uh, Roger? Anybody? Okay, non dwelling, no dwelling. Now, there is a, um, uh, I was watching a video um, and someone actually mentioned non dwelling as literally as dwelling and residing in the, the homes. I'm not sure how. True that is, but um, I kind of believe on more philosophical way of non-dwelling. So I would offer that the practice of non-dwelling is one of the uh, most effective. And it is, it is one practice that can transcend any uh, conceptual ideology or religious bias and directly reveals of our fundamental innocence, just this one practice. Basically, the practice of non-dwelling consists of continuous refusal to things that they are not real or to fixate upon or atten uh, fixate attention to anything that changes uh, impermanent, do, uh, including our moods, um, our hopes, desires, uh, fears, uh, memories, schemes or regrets. They change. They are not real. Uh, so in other words, it is refraining from clinging to um, <clears throat> any mental or emotional formation that would lead to a, uh, the fabrication of a separate and enduring self of self or ego. And in result, what we do, we take our uh, made up reality and our perceptions and think that they apply to everyone and which lead us to interfering in other people's business, uh, apply our made up agenda on others and thinking and talking about what they are doing, it, oh, it is wrong or right. Um, that is also a form of dwelling. And to demonstrate that, I have another story to share with you guys. Um, once upon a time, there were two monks, uh, they were traveling down on a path and they found this beautiful young lady on the ground. She was hurt and she needed to, she needed help and she needed to be moved to a safer place. Um, so one of the monks, <clears throat> he picked her up in his arms and took her to uh, uh, to her home, to a safe place uh, where she needed to be. And so. From there, they start walking back to where they were going. But throughout their journey, the other monk was very was bothered by what this monk just did because 
they are not allowed to touch women. Um, and here he actually picked her up and took her to her home. So he was very bothered by it. And then they reached the destination and he was still bothered by it for hours. And then he finally went to the other monk and he, he told him that um, his feeling about it. And he said, that was not appropriate what you did. Uh, we are not allowed to do that. I am not, I don't understand why you did that and giving him hard time. So the, the monk that that helped the young lady, he said, well, I dropped the lady hours ago and you are still carrying her in your mind. So this story shows us how we, anybody want to make a comment here? So this story shows us how we mostly think about how others behave, create our own reality, uh, don't evaluate the situation, judge others based on baseless rules, and also dwell on uh, in thoughts, live in the past or in the future. Uh, and very common one is uh, is the you know what to wear, um, how to show off. Uh, dwelling for people's approvals. Um, mind is always dwelling. We have this uh, need uh, for others to like us. Uh, we feel really good when you're wanted. Always thinking uh, that what other people will think, what other people will say. These are all examples of dwelling. And it is also worth mentioning again, and I have mentioned that many times before, that there is a huge difference between desires, attachment, dwelling versus life's bare necessities. Bare necessities of life are not desires, nor attachment, until they become obsession and cause suffering. If they are not causing suffering and you are flexible with it, uh, they are just bare necessities of life. And even Buddha, he discovered that he cannot concentrate without taking care of his body and mind first. So when he became enlightened in his first sermon, he said to satisfy the necessities of life is not evil. To keep the body in good health is a duty for otherwise we shall not be able to trim the lamp of wisdom and keep our mind strong and clear. So we have to be mindful and use our wisdom to see the middle way clearly. So no dwelling uh, practice when it applies with the sincerity and consistency give the ego mind, including the uh, spiritual mind, a.k.a. Uh, virtue signaling, no place to land. And on page number 211, Sutra mentioned that if you are stuck in a thought uh, or dwelling on one, then as the last thought ceases, you die and undergo rebirth. So your thought created the cause, um, cause of your reincarnation your thought. And that leads me to the next item on the list, no thoughts. Um, the, the working on uh, with the thoughts, it is a central practice of in Buddhism. And to me, no thought is an extension of no dwelling. Uh, no thought doesn't mean uh, not to think. It, if you remember uh, beginning of the book, uh, where Huynan wrote this poem, it is mentioned on page number 75. Uh, he said, originally, there is not a single thing. Where can the dust alight? There is not a single thing because everything is void. And for that, he was recognized as the sixth patriarch. So the void he experienced is called, and I want to try to pronounce it, Wunian. That means thoughtlessness a mind that cannot be defiled by any dust of thought. The kind of mind that is also mentioned on page 214 as the true suchness. True suchness is non-dwell. And so now I'm gonna talk about a little bit about non-dwell. 
on page 210, uh, Hoenen mentioned good and evil, and then on page number 213 about duality. We all know that this world is based on uh, duality. Everything that exists in this world have opposing pairs like yin and yang. So wherever there is good, there is evil. So the word thought in no thought refers to thought of original nature of suchness, uh, meaning the last thought that you will have before you reach the enlightenment. It is called in Sanskrit taditat, meaning our true nature. And in uh, Vimala Kirti Sutra, which is mentioned on page number 214, and actually Huenan mentioned that sutra many times, it extensively talks about the uh, non-dualism. Uh, the complete name of the sutra is Vimala Kirti Nirdesa Sutra. Um, I don't have enough time to extensively give you the background on that sutra, uh, but please look it up, Google it. It is another treasure house, and I am pretty sure you will enjoy reading about the sutra and the sutra. So now the question becomes about the no thought, that how do we train our mind for no thought? Um, our thoughts are like bubbles. They form and then they dissolve um, in clear water. And so, as Roger was mentioning earlier also, if we spend a little time each day refraining from following our thoughts like a slave and instead just observe them, let them come and let them go without attaching to them, that can be a mindful training. Huenan also said that there is no need to chase wisdom. Rather, when you, when one is freed from the 84,000 defilements, 84,000 wisdom reveals themselves. So <clears throat> when our mind is awake like this, our true suchness, our non-dual nature, our true nature give rise to our clear thinking, free from defilements and free from marks. What is marks? Uh, that is the no mark uh, item on the list here. So mark refers to, uh, I think uh, some of you already covered that, is the uh, six desires associated with our six sense organs, uh, our six faculties like eyes, uh, ears, nose, tongue, body, and mind. And the six desires are lust, vanity, uh, dignity, pleasant sounds, good life, death, uh, sensual pleasures. So when you are attached to dwelling, you're also attached to marks. Why I said that? Because the inside attachment um, is attachment of the mind, dwelling. And outside attachments is the external attachment with, uh, and they lead by our marks because Whenever we come into contact with external things like food, uh, taste, smell, sound, we attach to that external mark right away. And we are defiled because we are constantly uh, like and dislike things. And so you see that again, that how duality is playing another role here. And that leads me to the last item on the list, which is no dharma. And for me, this is the most important uh, uh, area that um, I wanted to talk about today. Um, on page number 212, Poynan said that originally not one single dharma can be obtained in the self nature. And in this sense, there is no such thing as a secret doctrine or a teaching which is only for few. Um, as far as the teaching is concerned, it is always open, so open, in fact, so ordinary, so simple, that it, it, it contained within the character of every person. And please pay attention to what I'm about to say now. Though in Buddhism, 
teaching and concepts are generally regarded as hindrance. But being a hindrance doesn't does not mean that it prevents anything. It is a hindrance and it is also the vehicle. It is everything. Therefore, we must pay attention to the concepts. Just don't be bound by them. Don't be tangled by them or blindly believe in them. So basically saying that we should first recognize and acknowledge these hindrance within, study them and bring them to realization. So a skilled Daokin or Bodhisattva will acknowledge and accept all these negative things, all these terrible things in him. And although it is very difficult, this is the only way to start. This way you gain a complete understanding of what you are, which is more important than try to live a concept or a dharma or a teaching. So the, the, the point of realization is not to try to understand only the awakened state and pretend not to understand the other side because that becomes a way of cheating oneself. If you just live by so-called concepts and teachings and dharma, it is acting according to one's conditioning rather than according to what is Ramda said once that beginning of wisdom comes from the capacity to look at what is. So the mind cannot be purified without seeing the things as they really are. So the person would not be have the ability to develop freedom or liberation because freedom is not properly presented to him. Freedom must be presented uh, properly. In fact, the word wisdom itself is a relative term. Uh, freedom from something. Otherwise, there is no freedom. Think of this way. If you are sick, we must find out the cause of the sickness. Only then we can get the treatment. But if we pretend that we are not sick, even though we are suffering, we will never find the treatment. So similarly, if you think that we don't have any faults, then we will never be able to clear our spiritual path. And once you know yourself, know now you will be able to apply the concepts and the, uh, the teachings as a proper treatment, because now you know uh, what needs to be fixed. So we must examine our fear and expectations. So if you are afraid of or fear of death, if you have, examine that. If you have fear of old age, examine that. If you have a feeling of uneasy about certain ugliness in, in, in yourself or a certain disability or physical weakness of any kind, you examine them as well. And you should also examine your mental image of yourself and anything that may you may feel bad about. Um, it is it is very painful in the beginning, but that is how you find your hindrance from in the freedom from. The kind of freedom that cannot be created by outside or some superior authority. You can't make this radical change in, in the pattern of your life until you begin to see your, yourself exactly as you are now. So we must develop uh, the ability to know the situation. Uh, in other words, um, one has to develop an extensive awareness knowing the situation at that very moment. Uh, an open and clear perception of what is now. And it is starts with the basic precepts, morality running in our blood, part of our DNA, having the wisdom to use mindfulness, see who you truly are and what it is. That's all you need to realize. Um, 
Here I'm going to uh, pause and then I'm going to ask anyone if you guys have any questions or wanted to make any comment, please floor is open. Roger, Sister Barbara, anyone? Well, I was going to read a couple of things to the end. But uh, it's important that she said what I said. Go ahead, go ahead. Uh, you had said some things that go, go, go beyond. Uh, Go, go, go beyond normal realization. I think we can get class. I thank you for that. Um, I'm looking at this idea of attachment or non-attachment, and I I think I think of some some of the people that. I've known that struggle with this in particular, and because of that, like we we say, it clouds their not not clouds, completely covers their wisdom. And what I'm referring to is Wayne's comment about thoughts of the past, present, and future are continuous like waves of water. To abat, to be attached to these thoughts is to tie yourself up to lock yourself up so you cannot be free. And you were just talking a little bit about that. Don't be attached to the past, present, or even the future. Now, it, it's, this, this is really a remarkable uh, a, 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 a thinking to bring up because the example I first thought of was a, 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 an individual I know who had some extreme, and I've talked about it before. She's had some, had some extreme traumas in her early life, like she was 10 or 12 years old, and she's in her late 60s, and she continues to live and use those every day as a reason for not changing. That's in the past. Uh, present, uh, there are so many people I know trying to live in the present, but not able to give up their past or looking at the future as a change. So, you know, I, I, what I'm saying is people are struggling in that area as well. And then if you think about the future, I, I, it comes to my mind when I was a child uh, living in a difficult environment uh, socially, economically, and physically. Uh, and the thing that I f was focused on and that tied me up was I was doing everything I could to make money so that I could go to college because I knew that I wasn't going to have any other option from uh, any other aspect of my family of providing that for me. And so I was fixated on that to the point, I won't call it greed, but it, it, it blinded everything else in, in my mind. So when you're talking about this, I think I, I, and I, I'm bringing up those three examples because I think they tie so clearly. And then I heard strongly that we are not to think about any of these states, past, present, and future nor about the external environments, all the things around us. And, uh, and to go on further, always to be in a clear, pure thought, period. I don't know how to do that. You know, I have, I've just shared you three examples. And so that clarity I had, I, I have to say, this weekend at the Dharma class, I had that clarity about 98%, 99%. I don't have that 98, 98% right now. Maybe closer to 80 or 85. 
And that's not easy for me to say. Uh, but I, I think about something that Master C always said. In order for us to change, in order for us to be able to look at ourselves, we have to we have to allow ourselves to be vulnerable. And uh, I keep talking uh, in that sense in the last good time, good six months, year. And the more vulnerable we become, the more inclusive I think we can become. But with that inclusivity becomes uh, more vulnerability. How's that? And to be able to get to that, to be able to get to that understanding, uh, it, it's not the intention. It's the it it's it's the awareness. And I mentioned in in Sunday that uh, I had met a, a young man in in Texas, and uh, he and I became instantly had this affinity i can't i can't I, I can't describe it any more than extreme affinity like we were raised together and this young man just turned 30 years old so he's two and a half times younger than me or i'm two and a half times older than him but we became such good friends that i was so looking forward to seeing him in january and he did not get to the point where we were talking about receiving a special blessing, but that was the, uh, the the thinking I thought was so evident in our relationship, as well as with his family and with a few friends of his that I, I got to know too. But unfortunately, he passed away four weeks ago, 30 years old. And that, that has affected me in a way that I can only tell you right now that that vulnerability that I was just talking about only is reinforced by that loss. Because if we don't have the, uh, the courage, the 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 openness to have that affinity. We are not doing what we're supposed to be doing, and and to me that's a big step. So I, I don't know if people know that about me, but that is a tremendously big step for me. And uh, that's all I'm going to say. Uh, and after you're done, uh, I I would invite uh, Master to talk. I, I can't say anything else. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Roger. Thank you. Um, so I'm just going to wrap up the class now. Um, every morning, if you think about it, we we have these 24 brand new hours to live. Um, and we, as Roger was saying, yes, it's difficult and um, sometimes it get even more difficult, but we have the capacity to live in a way that these 24 hours will bring peace, joy, and happiness to ourselves or others, or we can just get up and go and ruin someone's day. Um, we are very good at uh, preparing to life, preparing for uh, to live, uh, but we are not very good at living. Uh, and I say that because we know that we sacrifice 10 years, 20 years um, for a diploma or a degree, or we are, you know, willing to work very hard to get a job, a car, a house, and so on. But we have difficulty remembering that we are alive um, in the present moment and only moment that is for us to be uh, to be alive. So every breath we take, every every step we make can be filled with peace, joy, and serenity. That's our choice. Um, we only need to be awake, uh, alive in the present moment. 
each one of us should try to be the master of our own mind and body to govern this environment peacefully, to live a selfless life, uh, be kind and helpful to all fellow beings, truly helpful. Uh, don't pick and choose. These are our most important daily tasks. So we got to train our mind uh, and have these precepts embedded in our character as part of us. Uh, have full awareness of our six faculties. Um, have control on them. Be mindful and be present, meaning have the concentration, which um, in result help us um, to maintain our maintain and develop our wisdom, which gives rise to parajnya. And um, I recently read uh, this sentence, which it says that um, of the two witnesses, hold the principal one, meaning to start with the, your own judgment of how you are doing, looking within to see how you are doing on your spiritual path. And always maintain only a joyful mind, uh, meaning having a sense of cheerfulness, because you are not trapped in heavy handed uh, disciplines, especially if you have the third level of morality I mentioned earlier. So you can experience a sense of joy, particularly when uh, extremely evil or extremely joyful situation occurs to you. And the mark of being well trained and being mindful is that you can practice uh, your mindfulness even when you are distracted. And the self enlightenment means enlightenment by your own insight without an external help, learning by your own uh, and discovering on your own. No one can do this for you. You have to do it for yourself. Uh, because Buddha never claimed that he was an incarnation of God uh, or any kind of uh, divine being. He was just a simple human being who had gone through certain things uh, and had achieved the awakened state of mind. So it is possible, it is partly possible, uh, at least for any of us uh, to have such an experience. Um, if we if we practice some of this, what I mentioned today, I am sure that we will not have any problem in producing thousands of Buddhas and Bodhisattvas in this century. Uh, that was my talk for today. I hope the lesson was uh, presented as it was intended by the Sixth Patriarch. Uh, I also hope that it was helpful to you. I know it's always helpful to me um, because I learned so much about myself when I'm studying for these class. Uh, if I misspoken, I ask for heaven's forgiveness and mercy from Huynan himself. Now I turn uh, to moderator for any feedback uh, and uh, gaps to fill in. Thank you, Roger. Uh, no, I have nothing. I, I just have a quote. We realize the importance of our voice only when we're silent. That's how I'm going to end the day uh, with an invitation to have uh, uh, Master, uh, if she was willing to share some of her mercy with us. Good evening, everyone. And thank the grace of God and all the protection from the heavenly deities. Uh, we are be able to join on the Skype uh, and have um, share all our, our learnings uh, with each other. And the um, Sister Aram mentioned uh, about the sutra on page uh, 214. I'm, I'm trying not to pronounce it. Uh, there is also a, ch a Chinese translation name for it. It's called tainless. Uh, that means no dirt, okay? This pure, okay? So it's a very simple, so sort of tainless name or fame, a sutra, okay? This sutra is by a, uh, not by a monk, he, he, he was not, uh, he didn't become a monk. He was actually uh, come from a very wealthy and powerful family in 
the um, ancient uh, India, but he has great wisdom and um, very enlightened person. Uh, so he has a very great understanding of the Buddha's te teaching. And uh, supposedly he was uh, uh, in, in the uh, debates, he was uh, one of the, uh, the top ones, okay, in, in, uh, in the, the Buddhist teaching. So, uh, but that was, it, it could be a sutra that we can um, learn later on. A lot of uh, uh, Huinan, uh, six page of Huinan, has referred to this sutra in, in several places in, in when he was talking about, when he was giving his um, um, teaching. But I want to share with everyone of a simple story about, about uh, no, no mark, uh, no dwelling. It was uh, in the book <clears throat> that uh, in the Chinese version of uh, some of the explanation on this particular chapter. So um, here in this particular one, Patriarch uh, Huinan, he wants us no thought, no marks, and no dwelling, and basically um, no attachment. So there was this uh, story in the Tang Dynasty. There was a very, um, a very well-known uh, monk, and visited another well-known monk, so they could share and learn from each other. So this monk asked the other monk, and he said, "In your cultivation of Tao, in your practice, you know how." how well you're doing, you know, how much effort you put in there. And this, uh, the other monk called Hui Hai, which is like uh, wisdom ocean, okay? He said, of course, I used to put in a lot of efforts. So, the, and then the, the other monk said, at, at what kind of level, you know, what kind of level practice, what kind of effort you have put in? And he was uh, this Hui Hai, you know, the wisdom ocean um, monk. He, he very humorous, humorously uh, answered. He said, when I'm hungry, I eat. When I'm sleepy, I sleep. And the other monk heard him say that. He was like, by what you just said, you and I, like, all the ordinary people, you know, what kind of cultivation, what kind of practice is this? He, he's so, you know, he was so perplexed, not understanding, is this when, you, when you're hungry, you, you eat, when you're sleepy, you, you sleep, you know? What kind of cultivation is this? And um, this Hui Hai uh, monk, uh, he, he said, of course, there's a difference. When ordinary people eat, they don't just eat. They wanting a lot. They have the desires more. Oh, this tastes good. I want this. I, I don't want this. Um, I don't feel like having this. There are a lot of many things. They, they like, you know, think about taste and, and flavors and, and all that, right? But when they go to sleep, they still are calculating or planning for many things. They don't just go simply go to sleep. They may have to think about, you know, I have to do this to the house or, you know, tomorrow I have to plan, you know, do certain things, what I'm going to do. So this Hui Hai uh, monk, he said, of course, there is a difference. So we understand what he meant. When he eats, he just eats to fulfill his necessities, like, you know, Sister Aaron m mentioned earlier, the bare necessities in life, okay? He eats, he just eats. When he sleeps, he sleeps. 
but as we know, um, we're talking about being busy in our lives, right? Well, even when we are eating, we're not just eating. We have to watch our phone, which I do. <laughs> we have to read, uh, take the time to read, and then you chew, you 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 eat at the same time. You don't want to waste any moment in your t- in your life, right? And but here, from the story, is that we talked about cultivation of doubt is in daily lives. And from this story, we can review and think back in our lives. You know, really, are we having like six patriarchs said, you know, no thoughts, no dwellings on on things, no attachment to things. So that is the cultivation that that we are looking for uh, or, or striving for. Is it through there are many, many lessons, uh, and this has been taught to us in in many, many different ways, and through different languages, uh, doing using different examples. Like Sister Iram mentioned earlier, the ultimate decision is up to us. It's up to us whether how we want to cultivate ourse- ourselves. Is it? It's at each and every moment in our lives, are we able to have this no attachment, no dwelling in the tasks that we do, in going through lives, you know? And I, I think in the in the chapter about when the, um, Diamond Sutra, uh, Sister Aram talked about, we we studied that before. In the beginning, they talked about, you know, Sakamuni Buddha gets up, put on his robe and go in his bowl and go out and um, beg for food, uh, then come back, eat his food and then clean his bowl and put his robe and then sit down. Very simple things, very mindful, okay, at every moment and every task that he does. Uh, uh, he did. And it's the same thing like us. We talk about, we have talked about the um, Tao heart in the, um, our Prime Master C used to always tell us, is that that's, that's our purpose, is through our daily lives, in everything that we do, is to, without the entanglements from the human heart and and excel and use our Tao heart to excel in our daily lives. And that is what Six Patriarch is talking about, is constantly be in the concentration and let your wisdom show in every moment, every day. And thank you, sister. Uh, Aaron, for um, putting very good information together for us to to learn, and I appreciate everyone. Um, I have learned many things from you, and continue to learn learn a lot from you guys. Thank you. Thank you, Master. Uh, Mr. Ling. Do you, I think I heard someone. Sister Ling, do you have any comment? No. All right, sorry, sorry, Roger. Uh, no problem. Uh, if everybody would please uh, rise, we will uh, close the class.